And I'd like to welcome Lynn Melnick to the Rabbi's Neighborhood. Lynn Melnick is the author of the poetry collections Refusenik, which will be published next year in 2021. Uh, Landscape with Sex and Violence, which was published in 2017. And If I Should Say I Have Hope, published in 2012, all with Yes, Yes Books. And the co-editor of Please Excuse This Poem, 100 Poets for the Next Generation, published in 2015. Her poetry has appeared in APR, The New Republic, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Poetry and a Public Space. Her essays have appeared in LA Review of Books, ESPN, and the anthology Not That Bad Dispatches from Rape Culture. Uh, I've Had to Think Up a Way to Survive, a book about Dolly Parton that is also a bit of a memoir, is forthcoming from University of Texas Press in 2022. A former fellow at the New York Public Library's Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers, and previously on the executive board of Vita, Women in Literary Arts. She currently teaches poetry at Columbia University and the 92nd Street Y. Born in Indianapolis, she grew up in LA and currently lives in Brooklyn. And um, most importantly for our community at Adat Shalom, Lynn is the proud daughter of Michael, Dr. Michael and Anita Melnick, whom we love dearly. Uh, welcome to the Rabbi's Neighborhood, Lynn Melnick. Thank you for having me. It's fun to be here. It's great to have you. And um, you picked like the most quintessential New York loft scene to like in the <laughs> ceiling. Um, it's fantastic. Um, it's, not, like, it's, not as, um, it's not as hot as it looks. I'm like, I'm actually sitting in my daughter's bedroom right now because uh -huh. it's the little space that I've carved out for myself to work during this pandemic. I understand. That's your workspace. I got it. That's I got um, and, and what is life in New York right now? You're, you're in Brooklyn. Um, what area of Brooklyn? I'm in Carroll Gardens, okay. which uh, I don't know if you know Brooklyn at all. It's just south of Brooklyn Heights, which is just across the bridge from Manhattan. And, uh, and, and what is life like now there? Is everybody still in lockdown or are people? First, are New York City is still in full lockdown. I think they yeah. just started opening up Long Island today. So that's encouraging because we're, we're next. <laughs> we're it. Um, it was pretty grim, I have to say, in April. It was very grim. We knew a lot of sick people. Uh, a friend of mine passed away. Everyone was losing jobs, and it just, it was very, it was a difficult time. Um, also, I miss New York City. Like, I'm in New York City, but I just, I, we can't, public transportation is shut down unless you're an essential worker. So I've been very close to home. I was thinking I hadn't stuck this close to home for so many weeks since my oldest was a newborn. <laughs> and so um, it's, you know, there's, there's good to that, more family time and all that. But it's hopefully, it, it's starting to seem more hopeful here. I see, I think we'll be opening up soon a little bit. Good. Well, I wanted to start by talking about uh, the class that, uh, that you've been teaching. Um, you've been yeah. teaching poetry workshops for the American Jewish History Society around Emma Lazarus's famed poem, The New Colossus. Yes, um, which and has been just a real gift. Yeah, go and, ahead. And for people who don't know, if you could give a little background to Emma Lazarus and where this poem appears that makes it kind of so important to, to, our, to, to our identity. Absolutely. I love talking about her. So cut me off if I'm talking too much. Um, so yeah, I'm doing, so the American Jewish Historical Society had got this grant to do this project called the Emma Lazarus Project in which they recreate her, um, her sitting room in the museum itself, which is in New York City near Union Square. And she was a poet uh, writing in the 19th century who was the descendant of the earliest Jews in the United States, the Sephardic Jews who came in through Rhode Island. Um, and by the time that she was born, she came from a very wealthy family. And so this recreated sitting room is quite luxurious. Um, and the idea was that people would come in, experience what she might have experienced and read some of her archives that were digitally produced there. And then of course the pandemic happened. And so no one can actually go to that space. So they're doing a lot of stuff online, um, which is where I come in. And so one of the things they're doing is holding a poetry contest. Emma Lazarus was a poet and her most famous poem was is the new colossus which is the poem that uh if you don't recognize the title you probably recognize the part that says give me your tired your poor your huddled masses yearning to breathe free um you likely learned it in school when you learned about the statue of liberty it's um the poem that's on the pedestal of the statue of liberty um 
And so the American Jewish Historical Society is holding a poetry contest uh, for people to write their own poems to the Statue of Liberty. And, um, and that's where I come in, where I'm holding these workshops to sort of give people prompts on how, how do you write a poem now for the Statue of Liberty. And um, one of the things um, that's interesting to me about Emma Lazarus too, I mean, that's one of the first poems I ever remember reading um, is the New Colossus um, and visiting the, the Statue of Liberty. I don't know, maybe I was 10 and we were visiting my grandparents in New York and we went to the Statue of Liberty. Um, it's a beautifully written poem and it's also, um, what's interesting too is that it's um, the American Jewish Historical Society kind of tracks the, tr the Google traffic on this poem. <laughs> um, and it actually has received a resurgence in popularity since Trump was elected, since he took office and sort of started uh, trying to institute these immigration bans. And um, every time something in the news pops up about immigration of any kind, people start Googling this poem. Um, it was kind of lost for a while. Uh, people weren't paying a lot of attention. And I think it's probably the most, uh, probably the most important American poll. And yet it was forgotten. Um, and you know, and here's this Jewish woman writing the most important American poem, and it always seemed like a big deal to me. And I used to sort of bring it into conversations with fellow poets and in interviews, and yet it wasn't getting any traction until I think people started to wonder how, how threatened our democracy was. And so they began to sort of rediscover this poem. Um, I guess one of the, other things I would say about the poem is that in writing this poem, the way she, it reframes what we think of as what the Statue of Liberty was meant for, because it was given to us from France as a symbol of independence to celebrate that. And she reframed that. And so it's more, it's now a symbol of generosity and welcome. And she even says in the poem, um, here at our sea wash sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch. Um, and she's reframing even the idea of what might is, right? She's saying like, this woman is mighty, not because, you know, she's like the, you know, victorious um, or conquering. She's mighty because she's welcoming and generous. And I love that. And I feel like um, when I teach this class, it's so in the spirit of tikkun olam and in like, in it's such a Jewish sentiment, <laughs> this idea of reframing what might is and, and where that lies. And I love that. And um, so I always make sure to point that out when I teach this class. I love um, hearing poets read poetry. Um, <laughs> uh, one of my teachers, uh, uh, Tammy Schneider, uh, says that poets read poetry um, differently than um, normal humans read poetry. So um, yes, that's true. <laughs> can you do can you do us the favor of reading the New Colossus for those of us right, who right. aren't as familiar, uh, and uh, and then uh, and then we can talk about it a little bit after everybody hears. Sure, it. absolutely. Um, the New Colossus, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So powerful. I've heard that so many times in the past few weeks doing these workshops, and every time I read it, I get sort of overwhelmed with the emotion of that because it's just so beautiful to me. So beautiful, so beautiful. And we we were at the Statue of Liberty uh, last year, uh, so not this past Thanksgiving, but the Thanksgiving before, the week before Thanksgiving with the kids, my wife and I and the kids, and we took such pride in seeing that there and telling the kids that a Jewish woman wrote that. <laughs> Like of all of the immigrant groups to come through the United <laughs> States, it was the the poetry, the liturgy, the the imagination, the creativity of a Jewish immigrant that wrote yeah. that wrote those beautiful words. Yeah, and I think that's um, like one of the reasons that's always meant a lot to me, and um, and why I, I always sort of encourage. Um, like when I've been asked to pick out Jewish poems to, you know, there's a, there's a lot of Jewish writers, there's a lot of Jewish poets. She often was getting forgotten um, and, um, and she shouldn't be because aside from being a very important um, 
sort of sentiment and, and um, sort of uh, symbol of the United States, it's also a really good poem. Like it's a really well-written, beautiful poem. Um, and I, I also think like she was, um, you know, by the time she was born, like I said, her family was, um, you know, very wealthy. They had this brownstone and, you know, near Union Square. They, um, and, but she spent a lot of her time volunteering to help recent immigrants from Russia and other Eastern European um, countries. And I think, well, those could have been my people because that would have been around when my ancestors came in. So I, I feel this connection to her in that way too, because she would have been um, you know, working to acclimate all these recent refugees who came over in the late 19th, early 20th century, so. I have to tell you a funny story about the Statue of Liberty. So we're taking our kids around and it happens to be a day in November where there's a, just a blizzard in New York. So we're all bundled up. <laughs> like we're trying to walk quickly so that we can get back on the boat before it starts like full on sleeting um, because we're worried that we're gonna be like trapped there at, uh, at the Statue of Liberty and we have to get back to Mid this whole, <laughs> we have the whole day planned out of course. And, um, and we're walking around and I say to the kids, do you know why the Statue of Liberty is facing out towards the ocean? not looking at New York, like the beautiful, you know, vista that you can see here from the statue. And the kids say, no, and I, I explain that the Statue of Liberty is there to welcome everybody who's coming to America. Um, and just then uh, a tour group walks by and the tour guide uh, says, uh, does anybody know why the Statue of Liberty is uh, looking out towards the ocean? Oh, uh, it's, it's actually looking out because uh, the, the um, you know, the one who crafted the Statue of Liberty, I forget, uh, I forget the artist's name. He said that the statue would always look back to France, longing, remembering <laughs> its home, um, even though it had come to the new world, even though it had come to the United States, it would always look back, remembering where it had come from. And uh, I looked at the kids, I was like, no, he's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he's wrong. You gotta be wary of those tour guides. <laughs> <laughs> Let's now turn to your own poetry. Um, so you sent me a collection of poetry that was amazing. Uh, and I chose one that I thought would be uh, particularly suitable for Adat Shalom and the wider uh, audience of the Rabbi's Neighborhood. I'm contractually obligated. Every time I mention Adat Shalom, I have to lift up my coffee. Mug <laughs> of Adat Shalom. That seems fair. And the title of the poem um, that I picked out of the group for us to talk about uh, is called The Only Jew at the Mock Jewish Wedding. Mm -hmm. And I think this is such a daunting poem for people who are Jewish versus people who are Jewy, um, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is uh, the term that uh, the Unorthodox podcast use to discuss the two different uh, matters that I've, that I've adopted for my own <laughs> my own language. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, people who, who are, uh, I, I think religious is always not a, that's not really a good word because people can be religious and not necessarily be practicing uh, all of the rituals, but people who are devoted to Judaism versus people who are raised in a Jewish culture without much meaning to them. Um, and I, I, really found the only Jew at the mock Jewish wedding to be a, a polemic that should be read in synagogues. Um, uh, so, uh, so if you could please read it and then, and then yeah. we'll talk about it. Absolutely. Um, this poem is from my book that's coming out in February, um, The Refuse Neck. Um, so I actually haven't read aloud from these poems very much, so hopefully I will do it just <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't been out on tour with the book yet, but let's see how it goes. The only Jew at the mock Jewish wedding. My friend's missing father came from Mexico, but her mom wouldn't confirm it. Sometimes she insisted Greece, sometimes Peru. Eventually, we found proof in a Ziploc of documents. We also found a stash of pills and money. We took our giddy selves to the McDonald's on Wilshire near Fairfax, and I ordered the first trafe I ever ate. It felt less momentous than I wanted it to. At the mock Jewish wedding, they serve pig, it's hard to tell if it's meant to taunt or just that in Radzenau there are animals one expects to consume. My maternal ancestors told people they were from Glam Vienna, but they were not. They were from peasant Poland. The dictionary qualifies shtetl as formerly, but we never left. 
I once broke into a ballroom at the plaza and all I could think to do was put my boots up on a fainting couch. Even at mock Jewish weddings, most fetish bores me, but I suppose it's a comfort to burlesque the joy of what you murdered. Who are we trying to trick here? I mean this to be answered. How are we different, this too? There's so much bacon in the world. We came to this country to pioneer having it all. Then we forgot why we started our own country clubs, white hands tapping cigar ash at another lavish reception. Assimilation is quick, also impossible. In Ukraine, where Melniks originate, figurines of Jews are sold as good luck charms. In America, I'm hanging on inside my own pocket. I dare you to watch me parade my costume here. I am not particle underneath. If there is no Torah in the synagogue, I am still proof it is a building. Wow. It's so much better hearing you read it than, than hearing <laughs> my voice read it inside my head. Uh, yeah. So what inspired you to write this? And, um, and if you could share with everybody after I selected this as the poem to discuss who you dedicated this poem to, <laughs> and how I didn't know that, and how, um, how you came about including it in the collection, how you make that decision. Um, sure. Well, I can start there. Um, uh, it was funny because uh, you mentioned as we were chatting before this that it reminded you of, of my father. Um, and I said, that's funny because I was just writing the dedications to the book, which I have to get to my publisher this week. And I dedicated that poem to this poem to my parents. <laughs> so it, um, you clearly picked up on something, which is exciting for the poet when somebody can can read you well. So, um, I speak so with your parents I, often enough. I, I, <laughs> I can hear their voices inside my head, yes. Well, you can imagine how much I hear their voices. <laughs> yes. um, so I, I started, right, I, I had a, a, a fellowship uh, at the New York Public Library called the Coleman Center Scholar for Public, uh, for a Coleman Center uh, for Scholars and Writers, which is um, basically you get a year to write or research um, whatever it is your discipline is. So there were people there, there was one woman there working on um, the history of blood libel um, with Jewish people. Um, there, there, I mean, someone was writing an Andy Warhol biography. It was like all kinds of different projects. My project was um, a, a book length um, a collection of poems um, centered around um, my Jewish identity. And it was something that, you know, I think like everyone's, my, my relationship to my Jewish identity is complex. And I didn't really know going into it what it was that I wanted to say or even knew what it was I felt, which is why I write, you know, so I know, I figure out what it is that I feel. Um, so the book took on very uh, many forms and, and ideas as I was writing it. Um, and this poem came across, I was doing a lot of research too, because I was at the library and they have a beautiful um, collection of um, Jewish text there. It's, it's amazing. Um, and I was reading about how um, in some Eastern European countries that are, were effectively um, wiped out of Jews after the war, um, they've started to do these strange rituals which incorporate Jewish culture, but as entertainment. And so I read about how they have these mock Jewish weddings and other ceremonies, bar and bat mitzvahs and things like that, um, as entertainment. But because, and that's why, like, because they are taking place in a completely, um, you know, un-Jewish culture, you know, they serve pig at these mock Jewish weddings. And, um, and that really, that idea really struck me, this sort of uh, play acting um, of the culture that you murdered. Um, and so that was on my mind. Um, and it was also on my mind, the, how I felt about my own relationship to my own to my Jewish identity because I'm not um, practicing, but I feel, um, I mean, I grew up, um, as you can imagine, in a very religious household and I am I'm sort of steeped in all of the, the, the laws and the traditions and um, I have great affection for it. And I also feel like it formed me very much. I feel like a lot of my uh, poetry, uh, the rhythms of my poetry comes from Jewish prayer, <laughs> like just my natural rhythm of writing. Um, so I wanted to think about what it means to, um, to be Jewish um, and to have um, some aspect of your Jewishness incomplete, um, which is sort of how, you know, sometimes I feel adrift in that, you know, I'm so Jewish, but I'm also not practicing Jewish. So what does that mean? Um, and, um, and so that's, and, 
and that's sort of where the ending of the poem comes from. If there's no Torah in the synagogue, I'm still proof it is a building. And so I think that's a little bit your distinction, distinction of like Jewish and Jewy. Uh, <laughs> um, and like, what does it mean? To, because I feel more than like people say they're, um, you know, kosher style or culturally Jewish. And I feel more than that. Um, but I don't know what the term for that is. And I think the other thing I had in my mind when I wrote this poem was the idea of whiteness and um, what it means. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether white Jews are white happening at the time. And so I was thinking about that um, and, you know, the privileges of whiteness. So yes, we can assimilate into these country clubs that wouldn't have us anyway, <laughs> you know, but, um, but does that make us white? And um, and can we ever really assimilate? And I think that the rise in anti-Semitism or overt anti-Semitism in this country in recent years has sort of proven that um, that's somewhat impossible um, or completely impossible. And so all of that stuff, this is how I write. Like there's like 12 different things going on in my head and then they all somehow pack themselves into two pages. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Was there, was there a, I mean, we're, there were so many different uh, couplets or um, phrases that, that caught my mind. But um, uh, I mean, do you, when you say like, we came to this country to pioneer having it all, then we forgot why we started our own country clubs. Uh, are you envisioning um, uh, clubs in New York, clubs in Los Angeles? Do you have specific places like the, I immediately went to a place where I was like, oh, wait, was there ever a McDonald's at Wilshire? And like, yes. mine begins to, um, you know, first I read the poem and then I go back over it. Why was this powerful? And I, I begin to dissect all the details. You know, is this Hillcrest? Is this a different club? And then, I don't know. What, what, are, what are you talking about? So are there That's specific places that you're, that you're thinking about? Um, the, the McDonald's is real. Absolutely. Um, it was a McChicken that I ordered. And I'm sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> It's very tasty. Um, this is the fir that's the first yeah. confession that's ever occurred on the Rabbi <laughs> you should know. So uh, we'll, have, we'll have your parents on next week's episode and they'll respond. <laughs> I think that's probably, if that's the worst that it gets, I think they'll be happy. Um, but um, the, as far as country clubs go, I think I was just thinking of country clubs um, in general. Although last summer I was out, um, I'd been asked to read out in East Hampton, Long Island, and the person driving me around said, oh, there's the such and such cl country club. They don't really let Jews in there. And I was like, well, that's okay. Thanks for letting me know. I wasn't going to apply, but now I know. Um, I think I was just thinking of um, this idea of... Um, like we started our own country clubs, we started our own like social societies, and then we forgot why we did it, right? Like we, we forgot that the reason why we did it was because we were so hated, we weren't allowed in the other ones. And so we had to start our own. And I think it's easy to feel, you know, once you're comfortable and you don't feel hunted and you feel confident in your own standing to just sort of forget the bad stuff. Um, but um, I have a hard time doing that. And so that's where that came from. And I, and, you know, certainly I'm sure I had a lot of these. Um, when I think of country clubs, I think of Los Angeles more than mm -hmm. New York City because I think probably they are out of range of, of the city and they would have to be on somewhere like East Hampton, but I hadn't been there when I wrote this poem. There's all, and I mean, I, it's true in terms of us being hated. I, I'm not uh, discounting that at all. Um, but I also uh, thought in the poem that my mind also went to my experiences as a child. We used to go on vacation with my grandparents who were all survivors. Um, we used to go to the Concord Resort Hotel in the Catskill Mountains. And, um, and those resorts were also started because we were different and we needed our own fancy schmancy resorts um, that catered, quite literally catered kosher <laughs> for us, right. also catered, you know, uh, insane portion sizes and uh, <laughs> made us feel like we were never, we were never short of food. We would never ever be short of food again. But there's also something very special that I, in my, in my mind, in those memories about hearing um, um, Yiddish and, uh, and, and klezmer songs and, um, and you, you know, you'd be walking through the lobby and, 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 
you'd be, you know, um, you just hear sunrise, sunset, like, like, you, <laughs> is that sunrise, sunset? Of course it is. I hear it every day here, like, as I walk through the <laughs> And you'll, we'll never have that experience again of walking through lobbies of hotels. And, um, you know, I don't care where you are in, in, in Manhattan or in Las Vegas or, or wherever you walk. And everybody is dressed up to the nines and you hear, um, iconic Jewish music being played as, and so it's not just that we were, Hey, there was something very special about the construct of the culture of those institutions Absolutely. that also kind of dissipated as we feel more comfortable here in this country. Right. And also if you think about those country clubs and, and sort of that, um, that environment, which, you know, I also, I always, I constantly bemoan that my children will never know that generation because that generation of Jews was just fabulous. <laughs> and they were like, there's no, you can't explain it. You had to have been there. And, um, and so it, it, I wish they could have known, you know, my, um, uh, my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles. Um, but I think that like, there's, it's that idea of um, wanting to, you're wanting to recreate these moments and these memories in a, in a way, uh, sort of in a heartfelt way versus, you know, these people in uh, Eastern Europe now wanting to recreate these who have no cultural ties to this. And I think that sort of adds a layer to it too. Like thinking about um, what it means for Jews to gather um, is um, especially when you think of those Jews gathering as survivors and, um, you know, as, coming to this country to survive the act of gathering and owning their Jewishness is really, um, it's, it's a tough one, you know, it's really brave. And, um, so starting these country clubs was in reaction to not being allowed in the other country clubs, but it was also a place where you, you could own your Jewishness and celebrate it. And, um, and that was, I think, pretty brave considering what a lot of the people had fled from. Um, and so I th it's a beautiful thing. Um, and I do think that um, sort of the absence of that generation and time is, is a lot of what may, I always think of my generation um, as the one that forgot that we were ever at risk. You know, like we were, um, we were so comfortable, I think. And when I talk to Jews of, of, of you know, so Gen X Jews and, and maybe millennials too, like I feel like, um, there's this idea that we're comfortable um, and um, our reactions to things are, you know, coming from a place of deeper assimilation than our parents or grandparents. And I think the last few years have sort of with the rise in anti-Semitism have called all that into question again in ways that are surprising, I think, to some of us and completely unsurprising to others of us. That's right. um, so all of that was in my mind as I was writing this. Wow. Well, Yasha Koch, it's beautiful, and uh, and I hope people enjoy the entire collection. Um, the collection is called uh, Refusenik. Refusenik, and um, is that uh, can you pre-order that already on Amazon? Not yet, um, but uh, it should be available for. It should be up by fall, I think, okay. for pre-order. Well, when Refusenik does come out, uh, maybe we can make an evening of it at a Dot Shalom. So no, I, uh, <laughs> either either we can find a way to figure out how to get you to Los Angeles or. Um, or we'll, do it, we'll do it virtually like this, uh, where you can read some poetry and, and speak with the congregation about, uh, about it. I would it. love that. I would absolutely love that. I'm always looking for ways to get to Los Angeles. Now it seems impossible. <laughs> Tell me how uh, somebody grows up in Los Angeles and ends up being a professional poet living in New York <laughs> and actually publishing poetry, uh, which is... Yeah probably the same percentage of likelihood as becoming like a professional athlete or something like that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but it does seem, um, you know, I used to um, not harder. tell people I was a poet because no. it seems like you're telling people that you crochet for a living, you know, like they're like, oh, you know, bless your heart. <laughs> you know? like, um, it seems made up. It seems like a hobby. Um, but um, let's see, how did I become a poet? I, you know, I, I, I grew up surrounded by books. Um, and I think that um, what I'm finding out is, is that that's not typical. Um, and, um, and that was a real blessing to be surrounded by books, uh, not only at home, but we'd go to the library every week and just it's like books, books, books. Um, and I was surrounded by poetry. My parents had poetry in the home, which is even more rare than having books in the home. Um, and so I read poetry um, 
growing up. Um, and as I uh, became older, I think I became interested in poetry the way a lot of teenagers become interested in poetry. You know, like you write out your feelings. <laughs> I think teenagers are probably the most likely age group to be writing um, poetry, um, and then they stop. Um, and so I, that's how I started, right? Just to sort of process my feelings at that age. And, um, and, it's, and I loved it. And I found that it was a way that I could express myself and create. Um, and it just made the most sense to me. Like I feel, when I'm writing, I feel absolutely exhilarated. It's the, I can be writing about the most terrible things. And yet, like it's a, it's a sort of exhilarating, joyous experience anyway. Um, uh, and, and so, I, you know, I, I, you can't really like be like a, just a poet in this world. So I also, you know, I, I teach and, um, you know, I edit and I do other things um, and I'm writing a book of prose now. And, um, but poetry is sort of like who I am. And when I'm not writing, I feel it. It feels like withdrawal. Like I have, I'm having withdrawal from writing. I feel it in, in a bodily way. Um, and I, I grew up, um, you know, as you know, I grew up in LA um, and I have in the eighties, which, you know, is a very particular thing. Um, and it's kind of a very, an age of excess, I think. Um, and uh, I think that made a big impression on me. Um, and, but I grew up, my, both of my parents are New Yorkers. And so we would go to New York every summer. And I mean, I think it took them years to get their license plates changed from New York plates to LA plates. It was like this idea that like, well, you're supposed to go back. You can leave New York, but then you got to go back to New York. And um, I don't think they feel like that anymore, but that was the feeling I had growing up. And I always um, loved it so much when we would, um, even just like flying into JFK, I still get that feeling of like chills in my body, like, oh, this is home. And so I just always had that feeling that New York City made more sense to me than Los Angeles did. But the irony of that is that most of what I write about is Los Angeles. <laughs> Like, my entire last book was all about Los Angeles. Almost everything I write is set in Los Angeles. I have, if I sit here and I think too long about the landscape of Los Angeles, I will start tearing up. Like, I have, like, I had to leave it to sort of understand it um, and figure it out and feel connected to it. But um, now I remember I was in the car with my family. We had gone out for a conference in LA and the kids are staying with my parents, but we were on our way from the airport. And I just started choking up. We're in the, I think we were in a cab. And my daughter's like, why are you crying? And I was like, look at all these beige buildings with little windows. And, and, and she's like, what is wrong with you, mom? <laughs> like, that's not actually sad. Um, but it's just that, you know, those kinds of buildings with the amazing flora and like all of that just fills my heart so much. Um, so I, that, I process LA now that I'm in New York. It's <laughs> basically how that goes. I don't know if that answers your question. But. A little bit, a little bit. And, <laughs> and your, your mom was, was a teacher and your yes. dad was a professor in the sciences. Sure. Yeah. And were they encouraging of your, your desire to pursue poetry? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, I was not the easiest child, <laughs> put it that way. Actually, I was, a, I was a very easy child. I was not the easiest adolescent. Um, and... Um, I think that my discovering poetry was um, a gift for all of us because I found some outlet and some direction for um, for the feelings, for the feelings and the, you know, yeah, I mean, every teenager feels like they're different from everybody else. They're an outsider. And I had a lot of trouble, you know, in dealing with the usual things that teenagers deal with, like the hypocrisy of the world and everything's overwhelming and you're having, you know, relationships with people and all that stuff. And uh, I, it wasn't until I discovered poetry and poetry writing that um, I really uh, found an outlet for that and figured out a way to process um, all my feelings and to really channel in, into something that meant something to me. And so suddenly my interests weren't, you know, getting into trouble. My interests were reading poetry and writing it and going to poetry readings. And, um, and that was always very encouraged. Um, and my father took me for years to a reading series that was um, downtown. I forget the name of the reading series. It probably doesn't exist anymore. Um, I think it was with the Lennon Foundation. And they, they used to bring in like, amazing readers that I never would have gotten the chance to see otherwise if he hadn't taken me. And so, um, you know, they were nothing but supportive. I mean, I think, um, you know, as a parent now, <laughs> like your kid tells you they want to be a poet. It's not 
possibly the most practical <laughs> career in the world, but um, you know, nothing but support. There was never like, why don't you want to do X, Y, and Z instead? It was always like, <laughs> thank goodness she found something <laughs> that's, that's uh, of interest to her. So yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky that way. Well, I, uh, as a complete novice, I just want to thank you because uh, most of the poetry that I read is uh, Dr. Seuss to the kids or, uh, or Goodnight Moon. I don't even know if that's considered poetry. Um, I know that one by heart. <laughs> so um, uh, reading your work uh, the last couple of days, uh, you capture the complexity of the Jewish people absolutely beautifully. And I explain to the congregation all the time and... Uh, that uh, it is a shame that the Sidur is bound because mm. it's very misleading because it makes you think that uh, the canon of Jewish writing is closed when in fact uh, it, it should never be closed. Um, I once heard somebody say that at every Jewish library there should be a wing that is completely empty with a sign that says um, being held for the future uh, because <laughs> it, it continues to unfold and, and your voice and the way that you capture the complexity of Judaism, especially in this country uh, for uh, our generation, I'm just gonna throw myself into the, <laughs> the mix, uh, is a complicated one and one that we continue yeah. to sort out. And I think that um, we have the luxury, we're the first generation to have the luxury to basically yeah. sort it out. Uh, yeah. we have, we're the first generation being, being told that we can stop and reflect and think about things um, right. to the better or the detriment of, of our existence. Uh, yeah, I think about that so much because I think that, you know, so much of being a Jew is, is, is generational trauma. Right. Um, and so much of being a Jew in previous generations was um, present, ongoing trauma. And, and like you say, like we're this generation where we didn't have that. No, we, we, um, didn't, so we, we didn't experience the great trauma and yet we're being told all the time or being asked, are you feeling yeah. okay? Are you doing okay? Like, are you, <laughs> are you processing everything that you need to process? Yes. And compared to previous generations, we haven't really undergone anything that we, that, that, that needs that kind of, uh, that needs that's that kind right. of therapy. Yeah. Uh, but it, again, I think that's kind of uh, caked in, uh, that's baked into the cake um, in, terms really of, is. in terms of who we are and the way that we, artistically reflect on it right is that we yeah. we can look inward and we can and we can talk about it in this very thoughtful way um yeah, and so it's, it's endless it's very ripe for for investigation i think well thank you for joining us and mm -hmm. i look forward to welcoming you to uh the adat shalom community at some point in yeah, person to talk about your work uh whether that be uh in the physical sense or in the virtual sense and, um, and uh, continue to, please continue to be safe and healthy and be well in New York. Thank you, you too.